Thank you very much indeed. Now for our second plenary session. And um, before I introduce, no, actually, let me say this. Uh, let me say this. There are a number of the questions that were uh, put forward during this session which will be highly relevant to the later session, which will uh, start at 2 o'clock and run till 3.30. Journalism in Africa. If it bleeds, it leads. New money, same old story, because some of these things that you raised, Winston, for example, and others I can tell you have raised, will also be relevant to that session. And we'll have Solomon Mugera, who's a BBC Africa editor, uh, Omar Ben Yedda from IC Publications, and they publish the New African, New African Business, African Banker, New African Woman, Savannah Nightingale, a journalist and analyst at IHS Maritime, who's worked for a number of African television stations, and Barnaby Phillips from Al Jazeera, they'll be here. Luquesa Burak from Sky, unfortunately, isn't able to join us, but we'll have a lot. I, I guarantee you we'll have plenty of time for Q&A then, OK? Fantastic. Now, usually, um, when we discuss how Africa is represented in the mass media, we tend to focus on factual programming and current affairs. And, of course, we would, because that's what really gets people. It's very immediate, and it's usually crisis. But well, if you check the viewing habits of Africans both here and across Africa, you'll see that homegrown drama, both in TV and film, of course, is performing very strongly in some channels here in this country. They outperform uh, the other programs by double or treble, you know, particularly some of the Nollywood variety. And Gallywood, I think the Ghana and Hollywood is now the Gallywood. I don't like Gollywood, Gallywood, I call it. So the question is, um, what lies behind this and what kind of image is it projecting to Africans about themselves and to the outside world? What, I, what impact are dramas like An African City by Nico Amatifio having? Are they helping to change the game? Did I say your name wrong? No, you didn't. Amatifio. Amatifio. <laughs> Uh, are they helping to change the game? If you haven't seen that drama yet, when it was launched last year, or if you need a reminder, then take a look. Welcome home. The African continent finally has you back and just in time for the holidays. Auntie, did you buy me a shoe? Nope, I'm here for work. Contracts, big government contracts, that's it. We just had sex the bed you share with your wife, and you want to pray? Well, maybe he was praying for forgiveness for both him and you. Maybe I should set the two of you up. No way. Haha, <laughs> yes way, that's what I'll do. Black and anal? Dramas with big black butts? Why don't you just talk to him? Talk to a white guy about his one collection of black midgets? Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a lawyer. Okay. I'm not a therapist. We only sleep with girls. We look clean. <laughs> ben, aren't the three of you on the parliamentary committee for health? Did you offend a member of parliament? I told some stupid idiots how I felt about them. Oh, what's the damage? Don't worry about it. Just put down half. To rent? That's $5,000 a month. Yes. Is that how you both got your apartments? No. Um, daddy. Sugar daddy. My real daddy. My real sugar daddy. Is that guy really peeing in front of us? Really? Is that legal? I don't get it. I mean, I see three penises every day, unwillingly, because they just want to relieve themselves anywhere, everywhere. Nasty. I have a date tomorrow with me. So? You don't let men go below your neck anyway, so I don't understand what the big deal is. Seriously? You just flew a dirty condom into the air. It's not dirty. It's been in you. It's over. Go get married. Malaya! Hi, Shagoon. How long are you back in town for? I'm back for good. Nanaya, this is my girlfriend, Kokwa. That's his girlfriend. Yeah. Guys. I think Shigun is my soulmate.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. I'm delighted we've got such a lively audience today. Um, I'm going to introduce my panel briefly because you have their full biographies in your leaflets. Um, but I will just say that it's a real honor to have such a distinguished panel. I don't know how often we get this quality of film curators and creators together. Um, so I will just introduce them briefly for you. Um, so I will start on my right. Um, we've got Lindy Wei. She is a South African academic, film festival director, and film curator and filmmaker. Um, next to me is June Giovanni, film curator, archivist, and international consultant in African and diaspora cinema with more than 30 years experience. Next to me on my left needs a little introduction, Nicole, the creator of An African City, which you just saw, originally a communication strategist in social media who's now um, created this unique series which has gone viral since its creation last year. And then on my far left is Keith, Keith Shuri, International Curator for African Cinema and Visiting Research Fellow at the University of Westminster. Those are, don't even begin to summarize their experience and accomplishments. So I hope you will look in your leaflets at their full experiences and biographies. So today we're going to continue the theme of this conference, but also with a what I hope will be um, enlightening shift towards fiction. I think we're all quite already, if not before, by now, today, familiar with the challenges uh, we experience in news. I'm myself um, a news reporter, and I have been a foreign correspondent in Africa, despite being an African myself. So I feel like I know from both perspectives the challenges of reporting facts, or you could put that in quotation marks, in Africa. Um, but we're going to talk about fiction and whether fictional representations in film have their own challenges, whether they've been able to overcome the colonial legacy that was still so present in news reporting of Africa and what the spectatorship and logistical and financial issues for contemporary filmmakers, for <coughs> archivists, for film festivals are. Um, so, Lindiwe, I just want to start with a question for you, because you talk a lot about spectatorship experiences in Africa. Where are we in terms of African films? What are the, the spectatorship issues? And what is the legacy of colonialism in African film today? Well, thank you so much, Afua, and I just want to say I'm so excited to be on this panel because I think it really does pick up um, really wonderfully from the, from the panel that we had this morning. And, um, you know, there's a, the American journalist Alan Barth said that the news is only the first rough draft of, um, of history, and I think this is so important in recognizing the power of the news and giving us eyewitness reports, but also what our panel's trying to do today is look at the limitations of the news, what the news just can't do as genre, and I think fiction has, um, you know, has a wonderful potential here to really go into the imagination, to go into uncomfortable places that, um, you know, Know, that the news, the news really can't can't do, um, and tell you know the positive stories. So we hear you know I'm a bit of an evangelist for, for fiction in terms of the the positive stories that it can tell as well. And just to go back a bit historically, um, first to talk about the pr production of films, African filmmakers have always been drawing on news stories, and then you know, taking the more statistical, formulaic approach of the news, but going much deeper um, into the imaginative lives of individuals. And African cinema actually starts with this, um, with this very moment, with Usman Semben, uh, the great Senegalese filmmaker, reading a tiny little news report in a French newspaper about a maid who'd been taken, for, a woman who'd been taken from Senegal to France to work as a maid and who'd ended up committing suicide in France. And that was in the Fair de section of this French newspaper. It would have been thrown away the next day. And Sembin took this little moment and he turned it into this incredibly powerful uh, fiction film called Black Girl, which is the first um, sub-Saharan feature-length film made by a sub-Saharan African. And um, 
we have this, out of that tiny little newspaper report, you know, we have this, this film that is one of the great films in the, in the African cinematic canon, and that has also, to come to your question about spectatorship, really, you know, changed um, the, the principles of, of spectatorship as well. So, um, you know, African filmmakers have that potential to do that, and we're seeing incredible transformations in the ways that spectators are uh, today in Africa are dealing uh, with, with material. I mean, again, if we look historically um, at what's gone on there um, uh, you know you had these colonial film units that were mentioned this morning in the early panel that were set up across the African continent particularly by the British and the Belgian colonizers and uh, these colonial film units were making films specifically for Africans and if you look at the colonial film unit in um, Nigeria the head of this colonial film unit William Sellers drew up a whole list of rules about what should be made in films for Africans and one of these rules was leave nothing to the imagination so, you know, there was this assumption that Africans were such literal spectators that they wouldn't be able to deal with the imagination. Now, we all know that this is, uh, this is obviously absolutely ridiculous, you know, that... Um that there, there is huge imaginative uh, power in, in Africa. But the really frustrating thing is that one still finds contemporary examples of this today where um, I would say that what gets produced over and over is this kind of relegation of Africa as a literal space rather than imaginative space. And this is not just produced by the news genre, it's a pr a produced through the academy, through development agencies as well. And it kind of denies Africa its, ima its imagination, which which we all know is there in abundance. Just to give two brief examples, um, Jean-Pierre Bicolo, very well-known Cameroonian fiction filmmaker who's recently made a film called Le Président, which is a very um, biting critique of uh, Paul Beer's uh, regime in, in Cameroon. He's um, spoken about how he, I mean, he, he's spoken about how a particular European funding agency has kept coming to him saying, don't you want to make a documentary about Rwanda? And what happened there? Now, anyone who has seen Bicolo's films, which are incredibly experimental and engaging, would know that you know, Jean-Pierre Bicolo does not want to make a documentary about the Rwandan genocide. Um, another example would be from in terms of spectatorship, would be the, uh, the experience of many African filmmakers who go around the festival circuit and in Q&As after their screenings, they find that they are repeatedly asked questions about the history, the politics, the anthropology of the countries in which their films are set, but these questions have nothing to do with the <coughs> film that they've actually made. This would not happen to an American filmmaker, for example. <coughs> they wouldn't start being asked questions about the history and the politics of America if that had nothing to do with the film they made. So that's what I want to talk, you know, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about this literal space that Africa gets uh, shoehorned into and why I think that there are such uh, transformative uh, possibilities in the, the genre and the realm of, of fiction. Thank you. It's really interesting. I mean, June, you've got 30 years of experience. <laughs> I know. Well, it's so <laughs> impressive. Um, do you, does what Lindy was saying chime with your experience? And, and do you think that in the film that you work with and archive, and is there a sense that they're sometimes the literal prioritised over the imaginative or the, the figurative? Um, yes, I will respond to that. Can I just say thank you? Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that, that that discussion that the young man brought up about vaccination and those things. I think there's a bigger principle there, and I didn't get a chance to say anything at the time. And I would suggest that he looks at the film by Raoul Peck called Assistance Mortelle, which is about how uh, international and development agencies deal with um, issues and situations in certain developing countries and what the result is of a lot of other agendas that go in with that. It's, it's a bigger principle than obviously we could deal with in this discussion, but I would suggest that you look at that film. Um, I think that the issues that we're looking at today on this panel um, are perennial <laughs> um, because 20 years ago this year, 20 years ago exactly, um, we had a big conference at the NFT called Africa and the History of Cinematic Ideas, bringing together lots of African filmmakers, 
critics, writers, who came together to actually address a lot of issues about where African cinema was and how it was going to move forward. And in fact, um, uh, it's true that the history of, um, of Africa didn't begin with slavery and colonization, but as you've pointed out, around the time that Semben was making films, um, Africa was becoming, uh, a lot of African countries were gaining independence. Africa was becoming independent. There were um, discussions around where, how Africa will define its future and the role of culture and film within that. And I say this at, at this juncture in 2015, 20 years later, because I believe that questions of audience, questions of finance um, still relate back to who is setting the agenda, what is the agenda, and where it's, where it's um, in spite of um, um, uh, technological uh, changes and developments within markets, and so that, those elements are still part of what determine essentially what, what will happen and how, how, um, uh, how films and filmmakers uh, see their roles and how their roles are addressed within the work that they do. I do want to mention a couple of things that were brought up within that conference because, as I say, I think they're still relevant today. One of the things was um, the conception that was put forward by George Lamming, the Caribbean writer, who spoke about sovereignty as the capacity and intention of a people to exercise control over the material base of their survival and a commitment to define their own reality. And this was significant because at the same conference we had the Zimbabwean um, theorist and writer Tadfana Mahoso, who spoke about the problems. Ta Sorry, I've got his name wrong. Tafatawana. Tafatawana Mahoso. I remember Mahoso. And he spoke very much uh, about a phenomena that was, was being addressed uh, or that was um, very evident in um, the Zimbabwe filmmaking terrain, especially Southern Africa, but other parts, especially East Africa as well. And that was to do with the development film. I mean, we've heard today and we're hearing in this discussion about the role of development and the role of aid and development films, which were fictional and which were deliberately fictional because it was a strategy to move from beyond um, um, move from beyond um, uh, the factual presentation of the development agenda to a fictional presentation of the development agenda was, was something that African cinema has to address. I mean, it is true that although that has been um, recognized, there are other... Uh, the reason that the, these issues are perennial is because that how this works and how the agencies involved do it change as the technology changes and as issues to do with aesthetics changes. And I don't know if Keith will, I don't want to occupy too much of the time. I don't know if Keith will speak about that, but there are issues around some of the material that's coming out now, contemporary, uh, in films coming out of, of Kenya and other areas. Who are they, who is making them? Who is setting the agenda? Sorry, yeah. I'll just finish this particular point because I think there is an issue around um, um, the need to develop um, the subject of, of uh, African audiences in, as an area of study because I think it was something that was proposed then and I think it still is now. I don't know anybody that has been doing that but I think it does relate to a lot of these, these additional issues. My last point um, before I break is to do with um, one of the strategies of um, having sovereignty over your work was also discussed 
at that time. And it was led with um, a strategy where the filmmakers, or at least the national cinemas and some of the filmmakers, were looking to their own local um, governments, but also to local investment to start to put together the, the, the budgets for their films. Because very often, you a budget for a film, you will need partners, you will need co-productions from other countries. And the fact that you could find that locally um, was going to be a, was a strategy that a lot of people started to use. And in doing so, it was really important that the, that the agenda, that you were part of setting the agenda. And one of the things that was, that one of the theorists pointed out um, at that time also was that um, for Africa to become a significant player, and it would be a significant player, and this was 20 years ago, outside of the question of aesthetics and in rewriting, it was, sorry, it was going to be outside of the question of aesthetics and in re rewriting its own version of humanity. And I think that is so much the case. It's in the case of um, the films that are coming out of Nollywood. It's in the case of the sort of film that we've just seen uh, a clip of, the very um, commercial and cultural um, presentations. But it's also very much... The, 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 the agenda and the case of uh, filmmakers like Abdurrahman Sissako. And I particularly mention his work because films like Bamako and films like Timbuktu do address all sorts of issues that you will see continually in, um, in uh, development agendas, in, um, in factual programming, and in news, but it's a, what makes his work most significant is the way he can represent the humanity uh, as in, a, in his fictional representation of, of Africa. It is a unique skill, I think. It's a rare skill, and I think it's the sort of thing that is becoming recognized and needs to be um, uh, celebrated in many ways. I think that you raised some really interesting, well, a number of really fascinating issues there, June. But Keith, I want to ask you, um, I'm really interested in this question of whether the development agenda is now starting to influence fictional film. As a journalist, I know myself that my non-fiction journalism was increasingly funded by development agencies, something which I think is really problematic. And just to pick up on what you said, um, the gentleman from Millennium, I think... Of course, funding is a challenge, but I think there are real problems turning to either corporations or development agencies to fund journalism or fictional filmmaking because that comes with an agenda. But I would really like to try and get an answer to this question of who, is, who, who has the money, who is funding fictional film? Do you have any answers for us, Keith? And, and is this something that we should be aware of? Is the development agenda creeping into our fictional representations of film as well? Um, um, uh, first of all, I just want to... Uh... Uh, to put in context, I wanted to also talk about um, my, a little bit of my journey to come to, uh, to do this, um, which begins with um, you know, being born in Rhodesia at the time. One of the most violent periods of, of Zimbabwe's history was in the 60s and the 70s. And I think 30,000 people you know, died. That's one thing I'm just trying to, you know, to put something in context. And when we talk about the, um, um, uh, the, uh, the colonial units, what they were doing, I was one of the people who, were, who went through the process and it, through our education, through the colonial, colonial units that were set up in, um, in Rhodesia at the time. And now uh, the other thing is, the other issue is that uh, cinema came to Africa just um, maybe within 10 years after the partition of Africa. You know, the invention of cinema was in the 1890s, seven somewhere. You know, I think the cinemas came to Southern Africa, particularly South Africa, with the Lumiere brothers, where they were traveling around the continent, started in South Africa and maybe in, in North Africa as well. Uh, and, and uh, you know, 
as I was growing up, of course, I mean, I think, of course, cinema came with its cultural violence to the continent itself, that, which meant that you know, sort of whatever there was about cinema it's, uh, that was introduced to the continent had this kind of um, um, takeover of the space, which is the space, African space, and, and take away everything else, any, imagina any imagination of African, uh, African creatives, if you like. So, um, because I just want to make this very brief, and I was also remembering you mentioned the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the development issues. There was media for development in Zimbabwe, which was a setup in, 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 the, eight, in the 70s, I think, no, no, in the 80s. When we started the front, front line film festival in Harare, they were dominating the, mid, uh, the, the, the agenda for how to make films on development, which, which resulted in films like uh, Yellow Card and other uh, films that, uh, that became uh, the, 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 the genre, this type of genre of films that were introduced to the continent, from, particularly in Southern Africa, money coming from the United States, for example, from the missionaries, etc. Um, money is coming from, now it's not, the, the, uh, June and I have just come back from, uh, from, uh, from Nairobi, the government of Kenya has set aside $4 million to develop uh, the industry. The $4 million, it's about... Uh, On the continent. Of the continent, sorry. It's for the whole continent. The $4 million is to be spent for the next four years to develop a plan of action that would introduce, that would introduce the film commission that would look out around the, cont the continent itself, the kind of the programs that are... Should be, should be put in place to enable the African, uh, uh, the African film industry to develop. This also includes the film fund, which is going to be set up, and uh, issues uh, relating to the structure, the infrastructure. One, uh, once upon a time, Lani Nungakane, the, the late Lani Nungakane, South African filmmaker, suggested this, that the problems of African cinema itself, it's nothing to do because of, you know, it's, it's lack of infrastructure, Lack of uh, uh, infrastructure, which means that there is no, there is no, you know, space for us, for filmmakers, to discuss with their respective governments, to set up, uh, you know, the equivalent of the BFI, for example. The only one in existence is the NFVF, which was set up in 1994, as a kind of structure that would enable uh, filmmakers to discuss issues relating to development, production, exhibition, and distribution. And, and in that framework, I think that what we're trying to do is that to, 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 to help governments, you know, you, know, you know, in the continent to, um, uh, to address issues relating to film. And one question was asked to us, what do we want to say to, if we were to go to the AU and meet all African government, uh, heads of government? I, would suggest, I suggested this, that we need to say to African heads of government to look at film as business. So, so in other words, you know, it's not just somewhere removed from, from the, in a sense of that you don't look at it as a, as, a, as, as, something, as a commodity that will make money. So in other words, we need to actually get a, a formula that would enable African uh, heads of state to understand the industry itself. So that's the process, that's where we are at the moment. So I think this idea is going to be taken through uh, to FESPACO next week. And we continue, we continue to talk about the possibilities of, of, um, of uh, you know, persuading perhaps, you know, our respecting Afri respective African governments to contribute into the sport of money. And is there interest, I mean, Kenya set aside $4 million, is there interest among other African states for investing in film infrastructure? The Minister of Culture, the Minister of Culture of, uh, the, the, uh, the Kenyan Minister of Culture was one of the most uh, impressive Minister of Cultures I've ever met in the continent, um, decided to take this upon himself to go and meet with other uh, Ministers of Culture at the AU level. Because this is part, it's, it's, the, the money itself is handled by FEPAS, the Federation of Pan-African uh, uh, Filmmakers. And uh, he's going to meet up with his respective ministers of culture from different African countries to discuss this project. 
So, Nicole, <laughs> can fictional on-screen representations be commercially viable at the same time? Tell us a little bit about how you funded um, your, your series and whether now it, it feels like a commercially sustainable project. Ah, oh, goodness, that's depressing. <laughs> I was hoping yeah. you would say that. <laughs> Um, well, I'm hoping to get advice from others on that, but um, on season one, um, well, I first thought of the idea for Sex in the City, tech, well, the African version of Sex in the City 10 years ago, um, and I pitched networks, I pitched potential investors, and I wasn't going anywhere, especially because I had no experience in film. That was one of my downfalls. Um, so for season one, I decided, you know what, I have this goal. I want to achieve it, so I'm just going to make sure I set aside you know, X percent of my salary every month um, so that I can afford to do season one on my own. Um, and then, of course, talk to some family and friends to see what they can um, chip in. Um, so season one was more or less self-funded um, because that's how much I wanted to get another story out there about um, Ghanaians and Ghanaian women, et cetera. Um, then it looked hopeful. It looked hopeful that for season two, um, you know, with all the press attention that we got, that you know maybe that would mean that season two um, there would be money flowing in, and a lot of people think I'm now a millionaire. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just fifty thousand dollars in debt um, <laughs> from season one. Um, but um, so talking to networks and all the networks have talked to us. Um, but what I'm finding is there seems to be a structure that does not favor TV producers. Um, so it means that networks are really holding all the cards. Um, you know, so they want to give you a little bit of money and then have all the rights. And um, I've done one bad marriage before, not, not another. So, um, um, yeah, so for me, the commercial, the business aspect of it, I'm still trying to figure out. Um, but I, I'm doing it. I'm now devoted to it full time. And so we'll see. <laughs> and, and we know, I mean, I'm sure most people here have heard of it. I know when I was in Ghana, everyone was watching it. What has the perception been? What's your experience been with, in terms of audience reaction? Has it been the people you expected who've been watching it? How have they perceived it? Yeah, so this is all a shock to me because season one, um, I saw it as being a pilot season. And the pilot season, I was going to go back to all the networks that rejected me and I'll back to all those potential investors who rejected me and say, you see, look, um, you know, this is kind of what I was talking about. This is the kind of content I was talking about. And because of my social media experience, I knew that we could probably get about 5,000 hits per episode. Um, I wasn't expecting um, to now have um, over 1.5 million views on the channel. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't expecting all the media outlets from French L and um, Italian uh, Mary Claire and Donna Magazine in Germany and um, you know, people from Brazil call me to interview me. I wasn't expecting all the this. Guardian, you the Guardian. The <laughs> Guardian, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I wasn't expecting it, but I think, I think now I understand it. I think people were so sick and tired of war, poverty, famine being the only story that can be told about the continent that now you had um, five sexually liberated women. Um, it was different. It was new. Um, and it was different in so many ways. I mean, even the fact that you know, when creating the show, there were so many goals. So I'm seeing a lot of women in here with their natural hair. And four, actually, all five of the women have natural hair. But I had to put a wig on somebody. I said, this is, does not represent the African continent. That every, every. <laughs> so I, I put a wig on somebody. And she, has, she has beautiful natural hair. But I mean, because one of the goals is that anytime I watch black women on TV, they only have natural hair if they're playing a, 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 a role that involves a, it's a period piece on slavery, or their the, their poor maid, or you know. No, I wanted to send a message that no, you could be beautiful and glamorous, and you're rocking your natural hair. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many different goals that the show had. You know, we read some of the criticism. You know, somebody will say, "All all these girls do are, is sit in restaurants." <laughs> in the 1970s, do you know the kind of food shortages Ghana had? Do you know the kind of food shortages we have? So that now in 2014, the fact that we're celebrating that women can go to restaurants and have choice of restaurants, that's something to be said. 
Um, so the show's not shallow, but you have a shallow perspective when you're saying that all these girls do are sit in restaurants. When I know from my parents' generation, the story of food shortages, not being able to get food for your, sh for your children in the, in the 1970s. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we had a lot of- Women do spend a lot of time sitting in restaurants, in a yes. car anyway. <laughs> now we do, because we have that <laughs> choice. And, um, but it was also interesting because we don't question that when it's five Caucasian women sitting in, in the UK or the United States, but somehow it's a problem when you have five successful, wealthy, um, you know, done it themselves, uh, Ghanaian women. It was like this, the single story of the poor African women was so entrenched in our, even the minds of Africans that this, this story, this fictional story could not be, could not be told. It wasn't allowed. It upset some people, made some people uncomfortable. So it feels to me like there's a big gap because, you know, ev I've never had a conversation with any African person about the media without it involving a rant about the usual depictions of Africans, you know, um, women fetching water, bucket on head, baby on back, or uh, dictator, or oil tycoon, etc. corruption. Um, the, what you're doing, people, it seems, is what people this generation want what mm -hmm. they want to watch um it was interesting what you said june about the fact that there haven't there hasn't been any audience any serious studies of african audiences i mean can we say conclusively that this is what people want and if so where's the money for it why is it a struggle why are you fifteen thousand dollars in debt you should be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a millionaire you know from my limited 50, knowledge of 50 50, 50 sorry five zero my limited, market of, <laughs> my limited understanding of market forces something's kind of gone awry here does anybody have any kind of insight into the bigger picture of why this doesn't work? Right. What, what is this? Sorry. I was going to say that was a suggestion at the conference that was made by a Ghanaian filmmaker mm. and uh, writer and somebody who teaches African cinema is Nikwate. Mm. Nikwate Wu, and he made that, that, that question some time ago, but I think it's it's still very, very relevant, and I think that there is a lot of scope today. And because it covers so many levels, it's not just about, you know, the money. It's about this this interconnection between uh, the academy, between um, uh, audiences, and between finances. And I think it's a, it's that sort of tra trajectory is a, a crucial one to bring together to look at what's, what's happening now and what potential there is, because I believe that there is great potential. And are you seeing any change? Are things improving? Are they getting worse? You know, what direction are we moving in? Lindy, are you, you wanted to say? Well, I just want to jump in and say that Africulture, the, um, the African cultural <laughs> newspaper based in Paris, has just done a very recent interesting report on television consumption around the continent, focusing on six different African countries, not Ghana, mm -hmm. but it found that the most um, popular topic for TV series is love. So I think this helps to explain, um, you know, the success of, of Nicole's mm -hmm. show as well. And we cannot forget, uh, those of us who work with film, that... Um, um, television is the main site of consumption of uh, audiovisual fictional narratives in Africa. And uh, Anya Kachi Wambu was speaking this morning also about not forgetting ordinary people. We also mustn't forget that one of the main sites of uh, spectatorship in Africa are very basic uh, video halls, tin and wood um, structures in Kampala. There are 2,000 of these uh, video halls alone. And, um, and also to look at the creative ways that people are transforming foreign uh, stories. So it's not just about what's foreign and what's African. There are all kinds of adaptation processes going on. I mean, you all uh, TV programs and African sex in the city, you know? And wh what I found doing research in Uganda is that there's this whole practice of VJing that has developed, where the films that um, the poorest people have access to are bootlegged Hollywood and Bollywood and Kung Fu films. Um, and, but what you have then are these VJs who come in and completely re interpret the narratives of those foreign films for local audiences. And they're not just translating the languages um, into Luganda, you know, they, they're reinventing the narratives into something completely new and fresh that's often very funny. So, you know, uh, Eddie Murphy may be, become Eddie Armin in a, in a film, you know. And so that, you know, there's, we need to have a, a much broader conception of what constitutes creativity in general. It's not simply a foreign versus, versus African mm. thing. I don't want to get through this discussion without talking about Hollywood, and I'm glad you raised, raised foreign films. I mean, I, I know that um, the depiction of Africans in Hollywood is 
I, I'm, I'd be surprised if anyone here disagrees. It's, um, it's quite shocking. Mm. And, you know, uh, I went to a screening of Selma recently and it occurred to me that it took um, British, a British team basically to put that together. But they, the people from Pathy were saying, you know, it's great. There's this whole new tide in perceptions of black films. You know, we had... Uh, 12 Years a Slave, we had The Butler, you know, but these, again, films which involve a black person being essentially in a role of subservience with the white hero. What, um, what is the link between African film industry and mainstream Hollywood depictions of African film, and how important is it to you all that these African films reach an international audience, or should we be primarily concerned with African audiences? I think we, we, we do bring, I mean, for the last 20 years, I've been working at the BFI as, the, as advisor to the BFI, bringing African films at the BFI. And there's an audience. There's a mixed audience for that. In Nigeria, for example, we have had, uh, uh, is it gone too far? It was screened and, you know, in a stadium for about, no, in, a, in a sort of like a theater, which is like a, a bit theater, which is about uh, maybe a, a approximately about 1,000 people. So it's, it's, a, it's a question of how, how these things are, are put together. And I think that as people make films, there are so many films that are being made right now. The other thing is that uh, I was surprised that a few years ago uh, at the Greenwich Audion, in, you know, that there was never any African film put at the Audion. And sometimes people had to, to beg the Audion to watch, to screen their films. But now you have like four screens at, at, at any one time. Every week they are, they are full. In Nigeria, for the first time in Nigeria, the new, brand new theaters by the film house in, in, in Lagos, opening in Lagos and Port Harcourt, and the people are build, building uh, uh, theaters. Now, the, this is what I was saying about the infrastructure has to be in place first mm -hmm. to address all these kind of problems about audience. Don't forget, um, uh, in the 70s, particularly in Nigeria and other places, that they were destroying theaters in order to make, to make way for churches, for prayers. So what, then, then you have a problem. Now, you make films, but you don't have any places to, watch, to, to, to screen them because of the church. The church is one of the most you know, fastest growing kind of, you know, in most countries in, in, in the continent. So you have those kind of problems in the continent. The audiences are there, but you see the problem is that, so how do we get from, from you know, a, a film in, to that, to, to the audience? And then I think that it has to be done professionally, and again, the online, um, you know, the, in, uh, in, in the digital technology that is enabling people like Roko TV and others and, you know, Buni TV to be able to actually sort of get in online to be to create a business plan that would enable that, you know, to address those kind of uh, issues. But I think, you know, the audience is there. It's a question of how do you create a vehicle to get to that audience. But isn't Speaking the whole point of your work, Nicole, that it bypasses the networks and the distributors and it gets straight to people through online. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I would say I was not so caught up in the audience. I was, yes, I wanted a show that was for people like me who wanted to sit in Ghana but didn't necessarily want to watch Hollywood movies, didn't necessarily want to watch Nollywood movies, but wanted to find something that kind of represented who I am. And um, But I wasn't caught up in, in, in the audience. But what I found was I just, I did something that I think just women can relate to. Um, and so my favorite comment on YouTube was a woman who said she was sitting in, uh, she says, I'm a Puerto Rican American, born in New York, but I live in Italy. And what do I have in common with these girls? Everything. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was just, that was to me, it, it still remains my favorite comment because mm -hmm. that's what it was supposed to be about. It's just supposed to be about the female experience. We can all connect no matter where you are in the mm -hmm. world. And that, once again, the Ghanaian woman is not marginalized. Mm -hmm. You know, so people don't put her in the other, ca other, the other category, but put her in, no, we're all, we're all women and there's experiences that we all share. Yeah. Can I just say as well that in relation to your question about um, Hollywood and African cinema. Um, I mean, I think funding for African cinema comes from a mixed economy. I mean, you don't look at one area or another. It comes from across the board, in a way. Um, all different elements, whether it's state, whether it's, you know, personal investment, whether it's Indiegogo, whether it's um, some of the big foundations. But what is more interesting is that um, what people outside of the continent are looking to the continent for, especially Hollywood, is quite interesting. Both Keith and I have been on um, a scheme 
that's run by Focus Features, which is, as you know, is part of Columbia. Uh, uh, Focus Features. Yeah, for some years. And that scheme called Africa First was supporting um, short <coughs> films by African filmmakers. Out of that scheme came um, Rungano's uh, Once of the Great. Out of that scheme came Wanuri's, um, Wanuri's film, um, Pumzi, um, many others that, that you will have seen. And what they were particularly looking for, I mean, they're, they're not particularly benevolent. What they were doing is they were trying to establish um, relationships with <coughs> young creators on the African continent and to try and develop African stories for African territories. And that was a specific role that, that a company, a small company within a bigger Hollywood company was trying to do. And they had done it for Latin America um, with some new filmmakers and some other areas. And they had definitely been looking to the African continent for that because, I mean, big studios, are, after a time, they're pretty bereft of stories mm -hmm. and they see the continent as and the creativity on the continent and the imagination and the vibrancy of the African continent mm -hmm. as really this, this area that is going to provide for them this massive um, possibility for new films on the continent. Mm -hmm. And I think that that should still be explored. Of course, you have to know what you're doing when you're going into that arena, but I do think it's still a possibility. They did run, apart from the short films, they did have a number of films on their development slate for features. So the idea was that you establish these relationships with young filmmakers who, are, who have ideas and who have stories, and then you develop a relationship with them and with their feature films, you then put them onto one of their development slates and they're supported that way. And the reason I mention them is that I don't think it's the only strategy. That was why I said I think it's a mixed economy. Mm. There are very many different ways and different elements that you can bring into this mix about funding for African cinema. I'm going to open up to questions in a moment. I just want to ask one more question from the panel um, about festivals, because for those of people here who haven't been to Ouagadougou or any of the major African film festivals, are they thriving and what role are they playing in nurturing African film into the future? I'm interested in it. In, in I think, you know, the festivals play a different, different role. I mean, I think that everyone knows about the Ouagadougou, the, big, the biggest festival, the FESPACO, you know, commonly known as. And also in South Africa, there is a, uh, they, a potential big festival, which is the Durban International Film Festival. In North Africa, there is the Carthage Film Festival. And of course, in East Africa, there is Zanzibar International Film Festival. They all, they all play different roles. And Facebook is a traditional home for African cinema. That it means that almost all the filmmakers from all parts of the continent go, including um, you know, people like ourselves, I mean, we just kind of uh, just go and watch films and, you know, of course, p anyone who's interested in African films go goes to Fespaco. It's, uh, uh, it's not just for markets, it's just for people who appreciate African cinema, they go there for that. And, and, and of course, um, uh, the Durban International Film Festival, it is international, also set in South Africa, but of course, trying to bring um, uh, the crea other creatives and professionals from other parts of the world to come and, and network with South African and African filmmakers who go there. So they all serve different purposes, and of course Zanzibar International Film Festival, as it is, and I always find, I always felt that most people go to Zanzibar because it's a sexy name, mm -hmm. and because it's Zanzibar International Film Festival, people go there, but it's a beautiful place to, to, beautiful. to you know, it's, it's a place where it's not uh, Africa, it's not Arab, but it's all mixed with all these kind of possibilities that Indian you can Ocean. find in Indian, Indian Ocean, exactly. So. So, you know, you guys have a good life. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Doing the maths on a, your main work destination. No, <laughs> <laughs> no we don't get paid. Hard work. I mean, yeah, no. we don't. I'm joking. And, 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 and of course, you know, um, uh, here, you know, this is kind of like uh, festivals here taking place in the United Kingdom, of course, in African cinema. But in the continent as a whole, those are the primary festivals. There's Fespaco, as I say, and then uh, Durban International Film Festival. 
and Zanzibar International Film Store. Of course, yes. we have started another festival in, uh, in, in Calabar, in Nigeria, which, we think, which the Nigerians think that is the biggest festival. I say to them, no, it's not the biggest festival. <laughs> but uh, it's there, and uh, yeah. I've, I've just finished writing a book on film festivals. I think my colleagues were very um, sceptical of my of writing a book on this topic, as you say, and getting to swan around to these wonderful locations. But um, one of the things that really intrigued me that came out of the research is that festivals of all kinds have actually <coughs> proliferated in this era of, um, you know, of digitalization. So you might have thought that it would be the opposite. So you think, why is this the case? And I think it really is because people are seeking out more and more face-to-face -face live experiences uh, in, in the face of this digital onslaught and us you know, perhaps becoming more isolated. And obviously healthy debate with people from a range of different cultural backgrounds is always the basis for a good healthy democracy. And that's what I'm sure Keith and June and I could all give you many experiences from working at and being at festivals where one sees incredible debates um, and arguments happening but that um, you know, further this idea of, uh, of democracy. Um, now, obviously, festivals are rare, you know, rare events, and I think there's a potential there, too, because as opposed to the news, which we tend to watch regularly, you can, one can become desensitized as a viewer because you can see horrific things on the 6 o'clock news, and you know you're going to see the same things the next day. And so festivals and fiction films kind of freeze moments, and they say, take this one and a half hours out of your normal life and, and watch this powerful story. And, and for that reason, it can often have more impact on viewers than these rare you know, uh, genres that ask us to watch them regularly and therefore chuck them out regularly as well. I think festivals um, have, for a number of periods, had a really crucial part to play in adding to the, um, the whole strategy of getting African films out there because distribution is one of the big problems that African films face, African filmmakers face, with their work. And sometimes when films come into a country, this is one of the things that we had to do here in the UK um, in the 90s as well. There's less and less opportunity for people to see African films outside of festivals. And so when films came in, we would try to see what the possibility is to make a link between a number of cities. I know it's done now with some festivals here where the films could be leased for a period of time and then circulated to a number of those, not always festivals, but also um, film theatres around the country. And I know a number of countries that do that now because you're battling all the time. And if a distributor doesn't have the finance or is unable to take it up and there's no Channel 4 to, to do your, your television pre-sale as they used to in the 90s to help small independent distributors, festivals are now um, almost like a, a, a distribution circuit because they very often, for a lot of films, they're the only way that some of these films are going to be seen internationally. And I should say also that, that um, I work with showing African films in India, um, a film festival in Kerala and Chennai, and those countries, don't forget one of the things that, one of the contexts for African cinema is a wider one with, that, that links to issues and questions of third cinema. So whether it's Latin America, whether it's Asia, there are people that see parallels and that want to know the, the cinema of, your, of the continent and of the culture, and they are hungry for it. I've been programming with Kerala since 1997, and there is um, a vibrant interest there. There are even one or two distributors that are looking for films there. So I think we need to be as expansive uh, African cinema needs to be as expansive in its ambitions uh, for audiences uh, that go not just with the, the techni technological uh, approach, but through the, the structures that are there and that are interested in um, uh, seeing African cinema. One last question is around small festivals. I now work with a very small festival in Addis Ababa. Um, because they don't have much money and they are trying to, to get going. And one of the interesting things there is 
they, the, the most popular films and the biggest films are always the locally produced films, no matter how bad they are. They are the ones that you have to have on the agenda. And with that, alongside that, you can bring in films from other parts of the continent and other parts of the Pan-African, so the, the diaspora as well. But those small festivals have a very specific role in helping to develop people's um, tastes and helping to develop audiences and helping to actually expand um, people's knowledge and experience of their own continent. And I think that's quite a, an important one to have as well. I think that's a great note um, which to end our discussion here and open up to questions um, from the floor. So I will take questions. Um, I'll start at the back with the lady in yellow. And we've got about... 20 minutes of questions, please keep your questions to a question. Mm -hmm. I know many people have strong views here. <laughs> There's going to be scope to discuss and make points afterwards during lunch. So if you could be disciplined and keep this to questions so that we can make the most out of the panel members we've got here, I would really appreciate that. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, my name's Adelaide, um, and uh, it's a question and a concern that sort of follows on from something Afua and Nicole said. Um, which is that in 2015, there still seems to be um, a challenge around acknowledging the complexity and the humanity of black Africans on screen. Um, and that sort of ranges from, you know, the, the kind of depiction of, of the Ebola crisis to the sort of uproar and debates around black female protagonists in mainstream media, which includes sort of Nicole's um, An African City, uh, you know, the scandals of this world, the how to get away with, wor um, how to get away with murder. Um, and I'm just wondering whether it's well overdue in 2015 that that we, um, and when I say we, I mean Africans and non-Africans, sort of stick their heads above the parapet and say that, you know, something's got to give, acknowledge that there is a complete lack of um, acknowledgement that, that, you know, the representation of, of black people on, on the screens um, is as complex as, as any other race. Um, so just sort of the panel's views on, on that, really. So, I mean, I think individually most people acknowledge that. Are you saying there should be some kind of unified statement yeah, of Yeah, because I feel like protest. the current debate feels quite confined to just black audiences who are talking about um, the, the, the lack of, of diversity and complexity. And it needs, I think, for non-Africans as well as Africans to acknowledge that as well. So I think with an, the numbers of an African city, um, you know, we did see that there's a large percentage of those numbers came from out of the continent. Then there was an assumption made that um, the numbers that came outside of the continent were from the African diaspora. Um, but you know, some we don't really. There were a lot of non-Africans who were championing, championing the show uh, because they also liked the idea that hold on, the whole time I've been, I've been told that the continent of Africa is about huts, it's about lions in somebody's backyard, et cetera, et cetera. But now I'm seeing people who are actually either just like me or have their own stories. But whatever the case, it's a different story, and I feel like non-Africans were were behind it. So I think it's just um, the responsibility of. If you have, if you if you believe in this, then I feel like it's your responsibility to go out and do something about it. And for me, that's what an African city was about. I was not going to complain about this anymore. I was going to sit behind the desk of development agencies, pumping out the same old negative stories. I was going to do something about it with a show like an African city. And I'm hoping to do more shows in the future. And I'm hoping more and more other producers, directors, writers come on board to write their own stories, to make their own shows, etc. Because there's some people who do get mad at, at an African city because they say, hold on, but this isn't the story of the African returnee. Well, there's a, country, a continent of over 50, 50 African countries, um, over, a continent of over a billion people. Millions of us, millions of us, of, of us have left and come back. Um, there's not going to be even one story, even when telling the story of the African returnee, there's going to be many, many stories. Um, so yeah, I just feel like you I mean, when you watch something. Hollywood films about white Americans, no one says this isn't the experience of the white American. You know, <laughs> do you, do, does anyone here think that we should be taking it further and doing something to kind of build a movement? Um, I, think, I think that's kind of what you're suggesting, that there needs to be some kind of movement to, you know, challenge what is still existing. And it is shocking sometimes when you take a step back and look at 
people who don't go to these festivals and don't watch these films, the images, the messages they are still getting, who maybe haven't watched mm -hmm. an African City, mm -hmm. they are still getting the message that Africans... I mean, every time I wrote about sex when I was in Ghana, mm -hmm. I would have hundreds of complaints that I didn't mention FGM. Mm -hmm. And the idea that any African woman could be having sex which didn't involve FGM mm -hmm. is just too much for mm -hmm. our readers to cope with. Do you think that we should be... Well, one thing I will say, though, I'm not necessarily... I know everything I've probably said today sounds like I'm doing this for the ignorant, westernized person who doesn't understand the continent of Africa, but I'm actually doing, doing it, I'm selfishly doing it, because I'm thinking about my six-year-old experience in Gold is Green, right, where exactly I was asked about huts and lions in my backyard. So if there's a six-year-old right now in Gold is Green, I don't want her to be asked those questions. Um, for that 15-year-old girl in Scarsdale, New York, who's asked about, oh, does it mean that you're, you're simply, do you have HIV because you're from Ghana, da, da, da. I want whichever 15-year-old Nigerian girl is, or Nigerian boy sitting in Scarsdale, New York, I don't want him asked those questions. So I'm actually doing it, I'm actually, yeah, I'm doing it for those of us abroad who don't have to be subjected to those kind of questions. I think that's just something for us all to think about. Thank you very much for your question. Um, right, I will... Take a question from this lady in the front, please. I think, I think <laughs> the problem with that is that often people don't answer the questions because they answer the one that's easiest to answer. So we're not going to be able to take all the questions, but I do want to try and we'll see how it goes after the next couple of questions. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, hi, um, my name is Tokumbo Fatroch, and this question is directed at um, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So my question is, I'm sure there are lots of people here who are wondering or who have maybe desires to make a movie mm -hmm. or a documentary. And as we've all heard now, it's so difficult getting funding. Oh, sorry. What <laughs> advice would you give to anybody who has that dream and mm -hmm. still wants to make it but cannot self-fund because that's okay. an issue? So... Um, Besides getting a sugar daddy or sugar mommy, right? Okay. Because um, that's an option. Um, so season two, what's been very helpful, is, yes, we're talking to networks, but like I said, you know, they, they are, you know, throwing out some numbers out there, but the numbers don't still meet my budget. Um, but another option um, is sponsors, you know? Um, I might have to tell season two YouTube fans that, listen, if one of my girls is holding a brand or something product and taking placement. a whole minute to drink it. <laughs> Just forgive us, you know, it's product placement. I need to find a way to fund the series. Um, but for season two, if we don't go the network route and if we don't have a network pre-finance or give us the money we need to produce season two, we'll go the sponsorship route and basically, you know, five, six sponsors to give X amount of money and then we just pro promise them product placement. Do you not have to make a pilot to, in order to persuade sponsors to come on board? Sponsors have seen, have seen season one. But I mean, for, mm -hmm. for, for somebody else who maybe do, oh, can't yeah. afford to self-fund a pilot series Sorry. but wants to skipped bring sponsors on board. I skipped a step. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, a pilot episode is always um, a, a good way to go. And, you know, you know, for me, the way I see there was a lot of people who made some sacrifices for our pilots of the pilot season, season one, you know, so whether they did something for free, you know, call your sixth cousin, call that cousin and, you know, some, some, like, you know, call whoever you need to. There are a lot of people who are able to offer some support for free if they really believe in the vision. I don't call an African city uh, a TV show. I call it a movement. And there were people who were just really behind it, who wanted to see it succeed, wanted to see it change the narrative. Um, some, one, somebody, a blogger today called it my, called it my, my personal silent protest. Um, but, you know, I think there's also a lot of people out there who are just willing to be supportive. So find those people. Find those people who, who believe in your project, not just financially, but with other kind of support. The lady wearing the hat on the end there, yeah. Okay. Um, my name is and um, my question. Sorry. Hi, my name is Denise. And um, my question really pulls together a number of strands of discussion. There have been a discussion about audience and agenda. There's been a discussion about business case. There's been a discussion about the democratization of media through Twitter, etc. And really to pick up on two strands, one that uh, Nicole and June, is the democratization of finance through crowdfunding. I know June mentioned it in terms of Indiegogo, but my question really is how well do we have a grip of understanding crowdfunding in all of its guises from the investment to the rewards base to the donation base 
because it is about engagement of audience as well as finance and really understanding how that works seems to me that it may fill some of the gaps that have been highlighted continually. But I mean really understanding it and the platform that you're standing on is media, which I understand is pivotal to the success of crowdfunding. So is there some way to consolidate that comprehension and be able to come up with a strategy that pulls understanding of that initiative with uh, creators to ensure that someone can take care of the backlog of what needs to happen and facilitate that for um, people to make um, media. Yeah. So what, one of um, the actresses of an African city, Nana Mensah, who plays Sade, um, she has started a project or filmed a project called Queen of Glory. And to get Queen of Glory at least filmed, it's not ed been edited yet, but to get it filmed, she said 90% of her funding came from the West. Um, it seemed like Ghanaians and Africans weren't interested in financing her art. So yeah, right now she's doing an Indiegogo campaign. I think it's about five days in, and she's already over $17,000. Um, her goal is by end of May to have $36,000. But I'm just saying in five days she's been able to raise $17,000. And yeah, it was, she had a whole team behind it. Um, you know, the rewards were doable. Um, but she got the right, I mean, Huffington posted a story on her the other day, Afro L. So she had traditional media outlets um, and she had social, non-traditional media outlets really pushing the Indiegogo web link. And so now, yes, in five days, a Ghanaian American woman has been able to raise $17,000. And you guys should all check it out. <laughs> What's it? So on kickstarter.com. Kickstarter or Indiegogo? Yeah, kick, no, it's Kickstarter, and it's Queen of Glory. And I love Nana Mensa's philosophy. She said, you know what, we're, we're going to do this all or nothing. Please. I'm using Kickstarter, because the way Kickstarter works is that if you don't reach that $36,000 goal, if you raise $20,000, if you raise $30,000, all that money goes at the end of the campaign. Whereas with Indiegogo, you at least get to keep whatever you raised. But she said, we're going to do all or nothing, and that energized the team to really you know, go out there and with an all or nothing attitude. But I wish there were sites like this for yeah. Africans, you know? Um, and, I, and I think there have been some people who wanted to do African versions of Kickstarter, African version of Indiegogo. I'm not sure how far it went, um, but it would be great. I really think, I think it's a, a good question. I'm not sure which are going to be the institutions, but I do believe that national cinemas, national cinema institutions, which there are a number within, within the African continent, and uh, a pan-African uh, organization that's supposed to cover development of cinema on the continent, like, um, like FESPACO, needs to be involved in doing just that, mm. in putting out a lot of these strategies there. And they're in a position, because they work so closely with the AU, um, to actually make um, make the case for the legal and other infrastructure, of bus the business side of making these things happen on the continent and across the continent. So I think that those, those, those um, uh, are some of the institutions that can do that and that should be doing it. Thank you. Yes, the lady in the red over there. I should also say major festivals like FESPACO. At the moment, this year, they're discussing the digital landscape. And they're in a good position, actually, because they draw together so many people from around the continent to put it on the agenda and to have that as a, as a, a strategy where they bring together all the people with that information to actually make it, make it available. Um, hi, my name's Kaliki. I actually have two short questions. My first one is about African city. And um, to me, it was basically about women who were presiding in the diaspora and had been brought back to the African mass and were like just readapting themselves to its all, all its committances. But um, like, is there a final goal to it? Is there like a mm -hmm. final like, success that you're striving for? And <laughs> like, how do you cope and respond to like criticisms, especially from Africans that these women are white people essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my other question is how can we bring like authentic African especially African history to Western media or like a pan-African outlet to Western media mm. is the second question for me is for everyone could you yeah. just mm. repeat the second question sorry 
Oh, the second one? Yeah, I didn't hear it. Like, how can we bring African authentic history, in, uh, apart from slavery, into Western media or a pan-African outlet mm. into Western media? Mm. Yeah. Okay, good questions. Um, all right, I'll start with you again, Nicole, so, and then we'll broaden it out. And, and sorry, so what's your name? What's your first name? Kaliki. Kaliki. Oh, so Kaliki, what, what is a white person? Can you tell me what a white person is? <laughs> what's a white person? I'm, I'm turning the question on you. What's a white person? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> answer right. When you answer that, I'll answer your question. So. Um, while Kalik is thinking about that, let's. Anyone like to and, address and the another, second another question? Another issue is that uh, <laughs> you're talking about. We were talk, uh, June, June raised a point earlier on. No, no. Um, just, just your second question. One of the things that June said was quite important. People have to remember this. The fact that uh, focus features have been thinking about Africa as a, as a place to find stories. Because one thing he said, he said the future of Hollywood is, is, in, is, is in the past. So in, in other words, you know, there is no more stories from Hollywood anymore. So, and because we asked a question, I think he's developing also a story on Fela as a feature film. He's never been to Nigeria, but he knows that his, Fela is quite important. Everyone <laughs> knows about this guy. And they're developing a story on Fela as a feature film. And then of course, you know, the story itself you know, became a documentary, and of course people know Finding Fela, etc. but it is a feature film. And I think that quite several scripts that are being developed by other people from you know, somewhere else to try and find stories in the continent itself. And I think that you, you will find that, you know, I mean, because what Nicole is doing is just a, a small little thing about the continent itself, but you see, things can be possible in all different directions. And I think that, you know, sort of you have to admire the courage and also the, you know, the vision of, you know, of this team to, to have been able to do, to achieve this, it's possible to, you know, to do anything, you, what you want, you know, in the continent. Anyone else on the panel like to answer? The second question about yeah, about history. There, there's actually there've been a lot of incredible African films that that deal with history and pre, the pre-colonial history that we said it's so important to tell. There was a whole movement in the 1980s in West Africa, which is called the Return to the Source movement, uh, where filmmakers like Suleiman Sisse, Sheikh Omar Sissoko, Danny Kuyate told stories like the Sunjata epic, mm. often very cleverly as well, um, using that fiction to disguise critique of things in the present as well. So I think this is a big problem. There are those films out there and the kind of work that Keith and June and I have done as curators is try to try to let people know that those films exist because mm -hmm. a huge part of the problem is that there's just a lack of knowledge that these films in fact exist. We have that heritage there, you know? Mm -hmm. I guess on Kabore from Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. his work is focused on pre-colonial mm -hmm. um, um, culture and stories of Burkina Faso, but also the work of Semben Usman. I know that we call on him a lot, but his work, Chedo, was about a time of pre-colonial pre um, experience, and also even post-colonial, or yes, um, the, the colonial period. The film like Camp Thierroy, that the French never wanted an episode of French history that the French would like to forget, and tried to forget and denied in so many ways. Camp Thierroy is a, a film that actually represents that, um, you know, telling a historical moment from the perspective of, a, of a, an African uh, filmmaker. So some of these films exist. I think they need to continue to be made because as we've said, we're discussing here the impact and the importance of, of uh, fiction or dramatic films dramatic films representing the past. And what we haven't talked about a lot was the aesthetic impact. But we know that putting films in uh, a fiction format can sometimes reach a wider audience um, who might turn away from um, uh, a, a realism or a, a documentary presentation of that topic. So it is important that it continues. June, when you speak, I feel, you know there's that ad that says there's an app for that. A lot of the questions people are, feel like you, there's a film for that. You kind of have a film answer for everything. Where, where, when will, I mean, I hate to reduce it to this, and I apologize, but when 
will there be a day when I can watch these films on my skybox, you know, mm. when it's kind of available at the click of a remote? And how, how can people see them now? And, and is, there any, is there any way you can see it's going to get easier, they'll be more accessible? The archive. <laughs> yeah, and more, also, more and more things sorry. are going up on YouTube. So yeah. even with um, NAFTI in Ghana, um, National Institute mm. of Film and Television, um, I mean, more and more they're putting up... Uh, student films on their YouTube channel. Um, but I'm just saying more and more you, you do find these things online somewhere. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was talking about Iroko TV, for example. Yeah. You can find those films on the Iroko TV platform and also other platforms, several platforms that, you know, you find those films. And of course, if, you are, if you're looking for a kind of films, you know, this, um, you know, you know Martin Scorsese set, set up uh, a foundation, the World Film Found, uh, uh, Cinema Foundation, to restore classic films from all over the world. And then some, of, some, of, some of those films include African films, include Tukibuki, uh, uh, um, which, which are the Tukibuki... Uh, Cisse's film. Cisse's film, Fine. And, you know, so you can find those films that are available, but it's a question of actually, you know, finding a place where to look, and they have to... And as I say, online you can also find us. Boo, uh, boo, um, can I just add to that? Booney TV as well have, has a lot of uh, African classics online now. So, I, but I do think a big issue is that um, you know internet penetration across Africa still remains only at 15%. So we do need to take into account who still has access to these films online, and it's largely you know us in the in the diaspora. Um, there are exciting projects on the continent as well. For example, Dayo Ogunyemi's project Cinemart in Kenya which is um, a chain of cinemas for people who can't afford uh, ticket, you know, high ticket prices. So these um, tickets cost the equivalent of 20 British cents. And there's a whole range of films um, shown, including African classics, so that those films are actually shown on the continent to the poorest people as well. I, I mentioned just briefly and glibly the archive, but I do take it very seriously because it's what I'm trying to set up here. Um, and it's based on you know, all these years of curating African cinema. But I do believe the continent itself has lost a lot of these films and are trying to value and are trying to gather them. Archives are really important. And through archives, hopefully there will be um, strategies for making access to a lot of these materials available. And not only to the films themselves, but a lot of the art and the artifacts that go with African cinema, because it is an artistic, um, you know, cinema is, is a, a combination of a whole range of different art forms, including the publicity of, of cinema. And around it, um, you've got whole traditions and whole movements of different art forms. And it's really valuable that it, and that it should be, be kept and maintained. And so I do make a, a strong case for archives being part of that, that, that um, solution to how films continue to be seen. I'm just going to take one more question, then we have to break for lunch. The gentleman over here in the blue shirt. Um, my name is George. Um, I, I just wanted to, to kind of draw from the question that came from there, because it then made me think about what is what's bothering me about mm. the first two sessions mm. and how it might be connected to now and I hope we'll run for the rest of the afternoon. <clears throat> and it has to do with the what is by putting this what is the Africa in African cinema? What is it? The Africa in African cinema. Yes? Or rather, what is the Africa if you take Africa as the as the having a special place in critical in in contemporary critical theory, contemporary critical thinking what, what does it say about the subject of representation? Okay. And it seems to me if you enter it that way, then the question, who is the African, becomes clearer. So it's a very important question. It's also important in the sense that a number of people are beginning to ask, well, in certain in places like this one, well, how come I haven't got a black academic teaching me? Yeah? That's what she means about, you know, where I am, where, where are we in relation to the conversation going on? So it's a very serious one, rather than to dismiss it that way. And so I, let me tell you why I disagree. I, I, I hadn't finished. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't finished. Mm -mm. 
There is a di mm -hmm. difference between white people mm -hmm. and the whiteness of power. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what she's referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, now, just sort of park okay. that. The second, the second mm -hmm. remark I'll come to, <clears throat> the second remark I'll come to is, and I'm really very, I'm grateful to both June and Keith in a slightly different way for reminding us about two things. One is the, you know, the, the, the Federation of the Rhodesia and Yasland was, was the last bastion of Greater Britain. Yes? It informed, you know, Suez. You know, Suez, was, Suez Group was funded by Roy Walensky and all that lot. It, it is the dress rehearsal of the Bow Group, far right, new right in the metropolis. So Central Republic of Africa, post-war is very important for us to understand the politics of representation now. Okay? And the key thinker like Mahoso, interesting enough, he's been one of those people banned from traveling in this country for the last 20 years, epistemically sustained by, put it another way, what's the Africa in the Royal African Society? <laughs> so it is a very important question in that sense. Um, okay, thank you for your question. I know Nicole is keen to respond, and then I will put it to the other panel members if they'd like to say something. So before we did this panel, I remember Afor asking me, you know, what's one thing that has shocked you through making an African city? And I think what shocked me is, yeah, there were some Africans who said that this is not African enough, um, that this is an African. Um, but the way I see it, I consider myself Ghanaian. Um, there's a story of many African immigrants who were raised abroad, and whether they were raised in black neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, whatever, my cast are also women who were raised abroad, um, but they very much consider themselves Ghanaian, and I mean, and we're, able to, we're allowed to self-identify, and the art that we create, we're also allowed to identify as what we see it as being. Um, so when people come to me and say something's not African enough, I just can, can, my response is always, well, what is African enough? And I love it, especially in Ghana. I remember somebody asking me that question, and immediately we said, well, that, that, that Western suit that you're wearing looks just fabulous on you. Um, but he was talking about how it's not, authentic, authentic, it's not authentically Ghanaian, but I mean, I don't see him wearing his Ashante to work. I don't see him wearing his um, a kente cloth um, day in and day out. Um, but I'm, I, what is so interesting is that I feel like with the Western world, I was fighting against the single story put on Africa by the West, but now I feel like, wait, hold on, even to the continent of Africa, I'm having this argument against a single story. Anyway. Mm. Mm. Anyone else like to comment? And this is I'd why people don't create stories. I mean, this is one of the reasons. I was at the earlier panel, I believe you were saying that African women should be creating stories, should be putting it on film. But the way I see it, okay, I'm a Ghanaian woman, I put it out there, and then I'm going to hear these kind of criticisms, which, heck, I'll take. But it's, um, but now I'm hearing that it's not African enough. I think for, 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 for what it's worth, I'm, I, we're going to have to wrap up. I think um, it's a very valid question to discuss. I think there should always be a space to discuss what we mean by Africa and I think at the same time it's very worrying when people police our identity which is something that I think you're all talking about I yeah. have talked and written about a lot if anyone else would like to say anything I would just like to say something that came out of the keynote speaker um, at um, the Africa in the History of Cinematic Ideas conference Sylvia, Professor Sylvia Winter and this was 20 years ago. And of course, when we're defining things like Africa or African cinema, we're actually talking about representation. And what she said was representation um, is an, as an ideologically determined expression of being, is an uh, ideologically determined expression of being. So it doesn't exist without having a, a, a point of view, an ideology of where you are. It is part of what you think and how you think of and how you look at the world. And as such, 
African cinema is located at the epicenter of it. So African cinema as well is determined. It's ideologically determined and it comes from you taking a position, a particular position in one way or another. It's not apolitical. It is culture, so it is political. Mm. Okay. Wonderful. I think also, um, I just was taking a note as well, you know, when Semben said something like, unless the whole continent was prepared to fight for its, true, its own true identity and self-respect, smart, smart national anthems and flags of whatever color would not translate into a genuine liberation of the African continent. So you know, the identity is the, is, is the point of, of, of reference which he was talking about. You have to understand the cultural identity and you have to actually, you know, um, perhaps uh, vouch for that as a starting point to reclaim your identity, your true identity, and then follow through that path. And I think that, you know, for me, it makes sense. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. I just want to get a round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much.